I'm James Beckwith, President and CEO of Five Star Bank. As a community bank, we believe that open dialogue about the issues affecting our region is vitally important. From the economy, to the environment, to social issues, we look forward to the conversations and hope you'll join in. Hello and welcome to Studio Sacramento. I'm Jason Schultz, a reporter and producer for KVIE, filling in for Scott Syfax today. You know, America's Heartland is a national public television program that celebrates agriculture in America, and it's produced right here at KVIE. As a reporter for America's Heartland, I get to travel the country and talk with farmers and ranchers. I've really come across some fascinating stories. One of those stories, which we'll talk about in just a bit, is with First Lady Michelle Obama in her White House garden. You know, as we kick off our seventh season of America's Heartland, we wanted to talk with the production team and hear some of the fascinating behind-the-scenes stories of the folks that work on the show. So joining me today is Jim Finnerty, who's the series producer of America's Heartland. And also, you probably recognize this guy, Rob Stewart, also known as Rob on the Road, who's a reporter and producer for America's Heartland as well. Well, welcome to you both. Nice to be here. Good to be here. Good to sit next to you in the office uh, every day working on the show. It's great to be sitting around the table with you today. To, the table today. To it's just like our, our production department, right? Yeah, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> so, so, got thinking about what we're going to talk about today, and I thought about the fact that we've been at this for seven seasons, which is pretty uh, fascinating, and, and it's an accomplishment in television. And I think back to when this show started. There was interest among folks in where their food came from, but in the past few years, that's doubled, it's tripled, it's quadrupled. Folks really are interested in where their food comes from today. So, so here we are going into our seventh season. We, we cover that topic. We've been covering it for years. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have you both talk about how you think we're meeting that need of viewers to know where their food comes from. I'll, I'll start with you, Rob. Well, you know, one of the things that I hear with all the states that we've been to all across the country is that the farmers are saying thank you. And they're saying thank you so much for, for telling people where our food comes from. And as you mentioned, there really is an interest today. People want to know where their food comes from. They care more about food safety. And that's really one of the goals when we're producing the show is we try to find people who really can tell that story about, hey, this is where your food comes from. And I, I know people are responding to it because they stop me and tell me. And, and we've had some things happen in that seven years. Remember, we've had some food safety issues that have come up because of shipments of food from overseas. We've had some incredible E. coli and salmonella outbreaks, which have gotten great coverage in, in, in the media. And I think people are just more aware today of what they are looking for in terms of not only food safety, but issues like, is this good for the environment? is this really good for animal welfare, even in food production animals? So I think that it's one of those things where people have been educated by what's happened around them, and they're more likely today to have questions about, is this good for me and my family? And one of the things that I think about is the fact that so many people have opinions on the subject today, and there are so many people that are experts on the matter and, and are willing to have a blog or write a book or share their opinion about, about what's going on. And, and oftentimes, it can be controversial. People fall into their camps of, mm -hmm. you know, I am pro this and I'm anti this. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, that I'm proud of with our show is we take a pretty big tent approach. Um, and, and tell me about that and why, why you think that's important to not draw the lines of distinction that folks often do? Well, I think so much of the media today has a slant to one side or the other. And the Big Ten approach that we take is unbiased. We're not going into it with, with a purpose to show one side or the other. We're just simply telling the farmer's voice. Mm -hmm. And so I think that when you do that, you're able to get an honest opinion that is not swayed by a slant that certain channels on all different sides have. We fortunately do not have that in the PBS network, so that's it's a good thing. And I, and I think the whole Big Tent approach that you talk about, um, you did a story down in Florida with an organic producer, the Warden Organic Farm down in Florida. Mm -hmm. And I remember the interview that we did with her, and she said, you know, I'm not trying to force my opinion about what food is good for you and your family on anybody else. I just want to provide food, organic food, as I see it, to those people who are interested in having it. And we've done stories on organic farms, on community-supported agriculture, where people buy into a piece of, uh, of, of what that farm raises or grows. 
And we've done everything uh, right up to what you would call factory farms. There was the Fair Oaks farm in Indiana where they milk 32,000 cows a day. Now that's a factory farm, no two ways about it. But I think that what we're trying to show is, on our program, is that um, the simple answer is there's no simple answer. That if you want to have food for your family in the supermarket or at the farmer's market, that you're going to need a whole variety of suppliers and producers to provide what you're looking for in today's market. I want to pick up on something you said there with the whole notion of factory farming and labels and organic and sustainable that get thrown around these days. What would you say are the challenges that we face uh, that w when we go to produce a story, produce a show, um, to, to avoid those labels? Labels and keep that big tent approach um, without, uh, you know, casting aspersions on folks or, or using the buzzwords and, and things like that. Ha, ha, what are the challenges with that, Rob? Well, some of the challenges that I've experienced with that are just in the initial pre-interview phase with, with talking to someone and saying, look, we want to come tell your story. We want to come, and, and we're not coming in with any, any preconceived notions. We're not, we're not trying to force a label on you. We want you to label yourself. Mm -hmm. And you, be, you brought up a very good point where you said, you know, the, these, many of these farmers that we're interested in are not, are not looking to be labeled. They just are the, some of the most honest people on the they're earth. They're farmers. They're farmers. And they're good people. And Rob, one of the things you've done, uh, done as well, which is visit farms that invite guests, mm -hmm. and agritourism is what it's called, and that's a great way for farmers to have that direct connection. Tell me about some of your experiences with that, and, wh and what have those farmers found when they bring people on their land? I know all, of, all, all three of us have done some really fun agritourism stories, and many of these farms are opening up their gates to let the outsiders in so that they can come see where their food comes from, but it also is a revenue source for them to, to let you know com consumers come in and, and see how it's done. Many of these places uh, have overnight stays, wonderful lodging, uh, the Padlock Ranch, huge ranch sprawling over Montana and Wyoming. Great story where people can go and stay for the week, horseback, help uh, herd the cattle. I know you did this with a ranching show. And it's just, it's so much fun because the farmers say, that they've seen a whole new element to society when the person comes in and says, I had no idea this is how hard you work. And, and, and let me mention, because if you went back a couple of generations, as we all know, you might have had somebody in your family who might still be out there on the farm. True. Grandparents, uncles, whatever. Today, that's not going to be the case. I mean, there's 2%, less than 2% of the population raising food and livestock for the other 98% of us, not only in the United States, but stuff that's being shipped overseas. So your opportunity to have that personal experience with going to a farm or a ranch is far removed from what it would have been even 25 years ago. And so I think the idea that if you don't understand the work that go, and this is what we try to do in the show, if you don't understand the work that goes into and the challenges that producers face in getting that food, whether it's organic food or whether it's on a factory farm, to the supermarket, to your farmer's market, to your family, if you don't understand it, you're not going to appreciate the kind of work that agriculture the import it has for for us in this country. I got to experience that firsthand when I did the cattle drive last mm -hmm. season. Went on a three-day cattle drive in the mountains of Utah. Very cool show. And yeah. this wonderful family invites uh, city slickers to come and go for this uh, cattle drive for a few days through the mountains. It's a it's a heck of a it's a heck of a thing. And I was amazed at, and we, and we always talk about, well, folks are separated from where their food comes from and they don't know. I was amazed that they really w were uh, impressed and surprised at the level of work that goes into sure. it. They had no idea. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that's exactly what you're talking about, which is once people recognize that it is hard work and there are risks involved, then you have a little bit more respect, I think, to where it comes and, from. And let me mention one other thing. I, I think also that... Uh, what we try to do in our show is also show that farmers and ranchers do have concerns about the environment, do have concerns about food safety, do have concerns about animal welfare. Even cattle ranchers who are raising cattle, which ultimately end up as hamburgers in fast food places, you want to raise them and handle them in a humane way as food production animals should be handled. There was a story I did just about a month ago, this is no joke, on a farm in um, Tennessee. That family knew every single 
of their 500 plus cows by name. Wow. <laughs> Not by number, by name. Talk by about name. caring. They do care. And, and, and one of the things that I also think is interesting is, is the approach or the perspective that we bring to the show. Neither one of you grew up in agriculture. Neither one of you come from a farming background. And, and I have uh, some exposure to agriculture. I grew up in Iowa, worked mm -hmm. on farms in the summertime. My parents did not farm. They grew up on farms. I'm a generation removed. So I had some idea what, what went into agriculture coming from the Midwest. But I think that that gives us a unique perspective on that story where we can bring the view of someone who is in the city uh, oh. to the program. Can you? Well, that's one of our goals. Is yeah. we want, this goes back to showing people where their food comes from. I can't tell you how moving it is when you go onto a farm and there's children there who have never seen uh, where their food comes from, never seen a chicken, you know, where an yeah. egg comes from, yeah. literally. And, and I wasn't grown up, I didn't grow up on a farm. I'm from South Carolina, a very rural part of South Carolina. All of my grandparents grew up on farms, but I think it's a nice perspective that we bring because we are removed from it enough to be inquisitive enough, inquisitive enough to explore that. And that's exactly what we talk about. I think, I think the question is, as a producer for a show, there's a broad array of programs out there that you can watch on television. And here's a show that comes on, it's about agriculture in America, the import of agriculture in America. But I'm sitting there as a consumer. I'm sitting there as a viewer in an urban environment. And my question is always, as I look at every story that we do, well, that's great, it's a nice story. What's it mean to me? Mm -hmm. And that's what we try to do with every story, is make sure that we are providing some information so that you, the consumer, you, the viewer, come away from that story with a little bit more of understanding on how that agriculture impacts your life. Something that we, we have uh, just added to the show in the past couple of seasons is uh, Chef Dave Lieberman. He's uh, joined us for the show to bring some goods from the farm and, and cook them up. What do you think uh, he adds to the show, Jim, and, and what can we expect from him in Season 7? Well, I think what we've got in Season 7, we've got some things we haven't had him cooking with before, with pecans and peaches and uh, wine and olive oil and avocados in California and also some hydroponic tomatoes and some other things that we're shooting. Um, but I, I think it's just one of those, you know, cooking shows are very popular these days, and you've got the Food Network, and you've got shows like that, and you've got Rachel Ray, and many people like that. I think if you're, if you're looking at an avocado, and you don't, you say, oh, that's great, I'll have it with some guacamole. But Dave comes up with some additional recipes, so we make that farm-to-fork connection as to, here's what you do with the food that is growing here and we're going to show you what to do and give you recipes and you can go to our website at americasheartland.org find out those recipes and see see how they're prepared and that's the whole idea of the farm to fork segment good plug by the way yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, very good. <laughs> and it's a very it's a very popular uh, popular visit oh, yes. site uh, oh, yeah. part it's, of the website it, we the feedback on the recipes from our website is great and the feedback on the segments with Dave has been just phenomenal so we're we're pleased to have him and I don't know if there's another show that's doing that by the way that goes to the farm and actually sh picks the food and then cooks it. Certainly not in the way that we are. Right. Yeah, exactly. Not exactly. The way we're doing so, so thinking about you know that, that old uh, personal look back, right here. You've been doing it for a few years. Visited uh, folks all over the country. I was thinking about. It. I've been to nearly forty states and talked to hundreds of farmers. You know, your most memorable moment for me, obviously, it was uh, last season. Got to go to the White House, spend the day with uh, First Lady Michelle Obama, touring the kitchen garden that they've got there, which is a nice sized garden that the chefs use to prepare food for the first family and functions and events and then anything extra that they have actually ends up at a, a soup kitchen nearby. But she talked about that passion for knowing where your food comes from, also tied in with the childhood obesity element, which is a huge problem in our country that we all know about. So to me that was you know, a, an amazing uh, experience for me working on the show. Rob, tell me about some place where you've been where you said, wow, this is, this is a pretty cool job. I'm glad I get to be here. You know, this is not this is not a lie. Every single story I've left, I've been touched by personally or moved personally when it comes to the show of America's Heartland, which I think is why our show is success, success because we really do meet these people that just, they really move you. One mm -hmm. that really sticks out in my, my mind was in Nebraska, a program called Agribility. A uh, farmer who was injured in a car accident became a, a full quadriplegic. And this program, Agribility, built a, a ramp and a lift to put him back in the tractor and he's farming once again. That's how dedicated he was. 
to farming to get in there paralyzed, literally from the neck down, have a brace on his arm and get to move his tractor. If that one stuck with me. Really shows the passion that you have to have yeah. if you're going to be an agricultural yeah. let, let me mention two. What, one is a Nebraska story as well. There's a, two women who grew up in rural Nebraska who went off to work in San Francisco and work in the Chicago area in publishing and wanted to go back to Nebraska and set up a website called Nebraska Rural Living. And their whole idea is to have those people who might have grown up in a rural area or might be interested in moving to a rural area, move to their communities that they're talking about in Nebraska and get people back to the land as you were. The other one, we talked about the 32,000 milking cows a day, but there was a story that we did on the East Coast in, in Maryland and this is a family which I think is fairly typical of dairy farmers in America. They have a hundred cows, which is about the average for uh, the mm -hmm. amount of cows on a, on a family farm. But they, it's mom, it's dad, it's the son. And the story we told was, you talk about challenges. We had them working that dairy in the winter. You mm -hmm. know, you're getting, you're covered with snow all over the ground. Your hands are cold. You have to shovel up manure with a... You're covered with, with everything. You're covered with everything. <laughs> you're and, frozen and, solid. And, and it really was a, an indication of what it's like to be working in the trenches, as it were, on a dairy farm. Uh, and it really told the story of the kind of challenges and work that, that farmers do. And the amazing thing that I, I, I've discovered is, is you can, you know, step back from a distance and watch that sort of experience while you're there, you know, experience it with them and, and capture it on camera and say to yourself, wow, that is a lot of work. I don't think I could do that. And then right. at the end of the day, you're chatting with them before you're, you're ready to go on your way. And they say, I'm going to do it tomorrow. Yeah, it's yeah. The same. At 4 a.m. Yeah, right. Yeah, They'll be back there yeah. tomorrow, and they love it. It's not, they don't say, oh, boy, i got to go back to the office. You know, you hear people yeah. grouse about going yeah. to their cubicle. Uh, it's a completely different philosophy out there. Yeah. It's eye-opening, and it's such an experience. You go on these farms where it is sometimes, you know, three or four people running it. I asked this one family that I recently interviewed, also in Tennessee. They were newlyweds of two years. I still consider them newlywed. Where did you go for your honeymoon? Back to work at 4 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> I mean, they, you know, because they milked goats for cheese. And if you, do, somebody's got to be there to do somebody's it. Somebody's got to milk mm -hmm. those goats. And yeah. so it's just, it's a fascinating lifestyle. One of the things that I also want to touch on here today is the, the changing demographics of viewership of television these days. And not everyone is watching programs on the TV. And we find them wherever True. they are. Right. And so one of the things that we've done is reach out in social media arenas and on our website, americasheartland.org. We're on Facebook and Twitter and mm -hmm. YouTube. Friend us. Um, and, and talk to me about how you think that has helped grow the audience of the program. Jennifer. Well, I, I think it's immensely important today because we have a large segment of the population who never tunes in to a TV set. Uh, we're, we're happy to have them there. They may have seen the show at one moment in time. They've learned about the website or they've learned about it online. But they watch the videos. They watch the stories that we do. They watch entire shows or particular stories on our website at americasartland.org. Um, <laughs> it's and, number three, by the way. Very good. <laughs> and, that, and we have that opportunity to, to reach people in that way. We have, a, we have a, a very exciting and robust website which gives people a lot of choices. We talked about recipes just a moment ago, but it has educational resources resources and it has video resources and it has uh, recipes in, in one sort or another. So we find a lot of people today are perfectly happy watching the show online and learning from their friends as you talked about with Twitter or Facebook that it exists online and having a chance to share that with somebody else saying oh wait a minute saw this great video and and we have a YouTube channel as well so here's a way for you to see this show um, when you want to see it as many times as you want to see it. And Rob, isn't it isn't it exciting when you think about television and, and where it's come, you know, when we all first started in television, that instant viewer feedback didn't exist. Mm -mm, right. You may have had a viewer write a letter, drop it in the mail, yeah. and it may have ended up at the reporter's desk or the producer's desk. But now, literally someone can go online and instantly comment on our Facebook page or send a a tweet or a comment on the website. Tell me about how that impacts how you do your job to have that instant feedback from viewers. 
It, it really, it does impact it because right after a story airs, you'll get something on your iPhone or your Droid and you know, some, some sort of feedback comes in and, and we all monitor our feedback. We read all of it. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think there's a, a attempt to reach us that doesn't go unheard. You know that better than anybody. Mm -hmm. You're a social media expert for the show. And it does, it does impact how we work because we know we're going to immediately hear from people and that's good. Mm -hmm. That's why we're doing what we're doing. And we respond to them. You know, people make suggestions. This is great because people have a buy into the show and they say, well, here's a great story you ought to do. You know, I know these people or I know this farm and sometimes it's their farm, but in most cases it's some other farm that they may be living in the country and they want to tell you about their neighbor. And they send ideas in. And they send ideas mm -hmm. in and we use some of those ideas for stories that we, we might have done in the past, so that's great. But it's, it's, it's that instant connection to something that they want to tell you about and they'd like to share with you in hopes that you might share with the viewers. I'll tell you, I keep track of, the, of all of the feedback that I get uh, for America's Heartland and literally half of it is from people who've seen it online. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and one of the things that's exciting is someone can, like we said, go on, instantly communicate, and we can have a communication right back with them mm -hmm. on the page. Oh, yeah. So folks are out there watching this right now. You know, we, we do check that, and we do care about what people and say. And I, I don't want to mention that we do clear up misconceptions, because sometimes people will write in because you talked about the very polarization on some of these issues in agriculture today. And we respond, and, and I, I talk about the big tent approach when we, when we get back to them. We talk about the directions we take and give them examples of what we've done in terms of covering everything in agriculture, not just one specific segment. So let, let's ask this question. Wh what have the two of you, since you've been working on this show, I think back what, what I've learned about agriculture, and I'll get to that in a moment, but let me th put you in the hot seat. What have you learned about agriculture working on this show, Rob? Well, coming from 15 years of news, and then now I've been doing this for three years. So in news, you interview pretty much everybody across the board, right? Farmers are probably the hardest working people out there. Mm -hmm. They are there well before sunup and well after sundown seven days a week. I can't really think of many other jobs that are like that. So what I've learned the most is how hard people work to bring us the little things that we take for granted, you know, the things we drink, the things we eat. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's just shocking to me continuously to go out and see how hard these people work. Mm -hmm. How about you, Jim? Uh, you know, I think overall, the very fact that you come to realize that there is a large segment of the population, and I say large in numbers, even though it's only two per, less than 2% of the people producing food for the 98% of us, but you realize that there is this section of the population that is, just as Rob indicated, very excited about what they do and want to have that story told, and so they're really grateful to shows like ours that tell that tale about the work that goes involved in agriculture. And, and it's, you know, I, I want to mention it again, it just seems like um, we applaud the work that they do and we're not banging a drum for anybody, we're just saying, here's something you may not know about agriculture and here's why it's important in your life. And the thing that has amazed me working on the show, growing up in the Midwest, Iowa, corn and soybean country, is the diversity of oh, American yeah. agriculture. Yeah. I mean, you can you know, be on a, an organic farm in Florida where they're growing uh, you know, interesting uh, vegetables uh, that are hard to pronounce. Uh, and then you go to Montana and see the rolling wheat fields and you know, cattle and uh, it, it, it's a lot more diverse than I think a lot of people realize. And one of the things I didn't realize before doing this show is that each farmer diversifies. Oh, I, yes. I just assumed yeah. a farmer does X, Y, Z, yeah. whichever yeah. crop, whichever harvest, whichever. No, yeah. they've got their hands in everything. Their crop rotations. To their... stay profitable today. And, and to make a living, exactly, yeah. to stay profitable. And they take risks and as well. And take risks. Because we've done stories on people who grow sesame seeds. This would not be your corn and soybean story. Mm -hmm. we've, grown, we've done stories on people who grow mint in Michigan, one of the top mint producing states in the country, which is like... Michigan, mint producing state in the country, I, I don't know. So there's yours. unusual yeah. crops um, and specific crops that we never think about where they come from and we like to tell that story because it impacts their lives. There was, uh, you mentioned diversification, there was a farmer in Georgia who grows watermelons we just interviewed. Mm -hmm. In 37 years of farming, he's not had one day the same as the other. 
That's, that's an entrepreneur. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Who who changes to uh, meet uh, consumer yeah. trends? Mm -hmm. And that and that's and a good, mother nature. And that's a good word, entrepreneur, mm -hmm. because that's what they're doing. They're adapting to what the current consumer demands are, and they're adapting to what the marketplace is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Before we wrap this uh, show up, tell me the strangest thing uh, you think you've seen uh, on the show, or the strangest place we've visited, or, or the strangest crop that we've uh, explored. Well, let me start with Texas and feral hogs. <laughs> feral hogs are becoming a major problem. There was a story in the newspaper just last week about upstate New York having problems with feral hogs. Just wild hogs that go out, you know, they become larger and larger and larger in packs. And so you have this herd of hogs, I don't know what it would be, uh, but they're tearing up roots from the ground and destroying crops. I think and they it call them a bevy. It's a, a bevy. A bevy of hogs? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, but feral hogs is an interesting story and something I would have never thought about. Uh, I must say it's seeing birth. <laughs> I've seen cows born, I've seen a giraffe born, I've seen a horse, you know, drop her foal. It it still just blows me away. How come I've never seen that in the seven years? <laughs> I've given you all the birthing you. stories. <laughs> I've got some dates for you. When do you see a cow being born? Holy cow. <laughs> yeah, <Literally. exactly. laughs> Holy cow. Well, my my example would be yeah. uh, in Florida when I got to go to an alligator farm yeah. and uh, ended up in a pen with a giant crocodile. Wow. And the the guy who ran the place said, "Oh, it'll be no no problem at all until the until the crocodile blocked the exit." <laughs> and uh, I became part of the act. What did you think? I thought I was going to die. Is it was what huge. I thought. It was huge, yeah. yeah and it had killed alligator. several other alligators yeah. and crocodiles, so they had to separate it. It seemed like a good idea at the time, and looking back on it, and talking to my mother, said, so never do that again. Yeah. So. Next time you'll wrestle that alligator, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Anything think, for little, the show. little training, you can wrestle the alligator. 12 feet long? The horse, the, the it animal. was like 15 feet it long. Huge. It was a big one. Well, are you guys excited about season seven? Very. We are. Very, we, very we've excited. Got some, we've got some great stories coming, un unusual stories. We have more of the farm to fork, as you mentioned, with sure Dave Lieberman, so that's going to be great. And we have um, some fun segments uh, called Along the Way, in which we give viewers a little slice of Americana, in which I think uh, they might not see otherwise. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both for joining me thank today. You, it's been Jason. great nice conversation to be talking yeah. about the show. I love the opportunity. That's going to do it for our show today. Thank you both for joining us, and make sure you tune into Season 7 of America's Heartland right here on KVIE. You know, there's a lot of talk on television, but only a few places where you can be a part of conversations that matter, and this is the place. I'm Jason Schultz filling in for Scott Syfax, and you've been watching Studio Sacramento. Join us next time right here on KVIE. I'm James Beckwith, President and CEO of Five Star Bank. As a community bank, we believe that open dialogue about the issues affecting our region is vitally important. From the economy, to the environment, to social issues, we look forward to the conversations and hope you'll join in.